going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. We're continuing on with the Vital Signs Assessment Series and today we're going to be looking at pulse oximetry. Let's get started. So what is pulse oximetry? Well, it's a non-invasive test that registers the oxygen saturation of the patient's hemoglobin. So that's the capillary oxygen saturation, that's our SAO2, is recorded as a percentage. So our normal ranges when it comes to the SAO2 or SpO2 is going to be between 90 to 100% with our adult patients. So in order to perform this procedure, we need to begin by gathering our equipment needed for the examination. That's handled with the pulse oximetry or cables for vital signs machines. So you can either have the little finger one or you can have the vital signs um, ones that connect to the actual cardiac monitors. Pulse oximetry procedures. So we're gonna begin by placing the sensor on the patient's finger, toe, nose, earlobe, or forehead to measure oxygen saturation, which then is displayed on the monitor. So if you have the finger probe, you're only going to be able to place it on the finger, but if you have the SpO2 monitoring that's connected to the machine, you've got a lot more options. Do not select an extremity with an impediment to blood flow. A usual pulse oximetry reading is between 95 to 100% for our adults, right? So a pulse oximetry reading less than 90% warrants notification to the provider immediately as well as interventions. Some values below 90% are acceptable only in certain chronic conditions. So sometimes you're going to have um, your CHFers or your COPDers are really bad when it comes to their um, CO2 as well as their oximetry. So that's really something you need to have a discussion with the provider as well as your respiratory care team to determine what is normal and what is okay. As always, follow your hospital and provider's orders regarding vital signs collection data when it comes to your patient population. So let's talk about some nursing considerations when it comes to pulse oximetry. A vascular pulsatile area such as a fingertip or earlobe is needed to detect the degree of change in the transmitted light that measures the oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Factors that affect light transmission also affect the measurement of our SpO2. So what are those factors? That could be fingernail polish, sensor movement, hypotensive patients, anemic patients, as well as those patients that have peripheral vascular disorders. So let's start considering some critical thinking when it comes to pulse oximetry. So to begin, after a hypoxic patient uses up that readily available oxygen in the system, that's that arterial oxygen pressure, our PaO2, that reserve oxygen, that's the oxygen attached to our hemoglobin, is drawn on to provide oxygen to our tissues. So a pulse oximetry reading can alert the nurse to hypoxemia before clinical signs start to occur. However, there's another reading that's even better than our pulse oximetry reading when it comes to early signs of clinical deterioration, and that is our end tidal caponography. This can actually alert the nurse to hypoxemia and worsening CO2 retention much faster than a pulse oximetry reading can. So when you have like a post-surgical patient or someone that you're very concerned about um, that looks like they might start clinical, clinically deteriorating, this is a tremendous tool in your tool bag that you can use with these patients. If pulse oximetry readings are below normal, you want to instruct the patient to take some deep breathing exercises and recheck their pulse oximetry. Sometimes, depending on um, what the patient is there for and what interventions have been uh, done already, you might want to use a tool called an incentive spirometry. And what the incentive spirometry does is it helps open up the patient's lungs. So sometimes, you know, depending on if there's pain in an area, the patient might not breathe as well. So this incentive spirometry really starts to open up those alveoli and really start to get that oxygen into the system. So that's going to be your first intervention to see if that works. And if that doesn't work, then absolutely throw some oxygen on your patient. I hope that these videos were helpful in understanding vital signs assessments. Make sure you check me out on my social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe here on YouTube and turn on that bell notification so that way you're notified 
every time I post a new video. Go over to my website at www.nursechung.com where there'll be additional resources based on these vital sign videos. But until next time, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you all again soon. Bye.